ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಸೊಲ್ಮೇಲ ಐ ಬಿ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲಿಷ್ ಟುಡೆ ಐ ಹೋಪ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಓಕೆ ವಿತ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಒನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಐಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಆ್ಯಡ್ ಟು ಮೈ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ರಿಸೀವ್ ದ ಫೀಲಿಕ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಕಾಲರ್ಶಿಪ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಮೈ ಎಮ್ ಎ ಇನ್ ಟೈಪ್ ಡಿಸೈನ್ ಇಟ್ ಗೇವ್ ಮೀ ಫೈನಾನ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಫ್ರೀಡಮ್ ಟು ಪರ್ಸ್ಯೂ ಮೈ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಪೋಸ್ಟ್ ಮೈ ಎಜುಕೇಷನ್ ಐಲ್ ಬಿ ಫಾರ್ ಎವರ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಟು ದ ಫೀಲಿಕ್ಸ್ ಫೌಂಡೇಶನ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ a couple of months back i had come to the mythic society to meet uh, mr uday kumar to see his work on inscription stones of bangalore uh, it is uh, really a path breaking undertaking and one of my favorite projects that's happening right now for those of you who haven't seen uh, what they've been up to i urge you to like google inscription stones of bangalore and see the kind of work that they're doing there it's quite remarkable and uh, that's when i met mr jaisema who asked me to come here and present my work here i thank them and the mythic society for giving me such a prestigious stage uh, to share my work at and uh, thank you all for attending this talk here today on a sunday morning <laughs> and the topic uh, we are going to be talking about today is the tulu tigilari script so the word script uh, actually means akshara in sanskrit um so akshara literally means never ending so this topic is never ending of aksharas uh, so today i'll be sticking as close to the tulu tigilari script as possible and i'll try not to digress from it too much and uh, there's a lot to share just about this one particular topic um i was told that there'll be experts as well as people who are new to this field who will be attending this talk so i'll uh, start from the very basics um in the beginning i'll talk about the prehistoric art to brahmi then i'll be talking about brahmi to tigilari then i'll be looking especially at the tulu tigilari script and uh, towards the end i'll be talking about my work on the tulu tigilari script and uh, the unicode encoding uh, work that has gone on, gone into it so this is the absolute uh, f- basics that is history is not static though we can't go back to change it as we discover new things our understandings and interpretations of the past keep changing much like science its theories and conclusions evolve over time <coughs> so now let's look at the early scriptscapes between um, the prehistoric rock art and the the brahmi script in india so if you look at the prehistoric rock art uh, it essentially goes back to 30000 to about 6000 years it goes back much much further than this as well but this is uh, the time when you find a bulk of uh, the prehistoric rock art in uh, caves and piece of pottery and bones etc uh, here there are a couple of names mentioned to the top left who have been researching on this uh they have what they what they found is that there are a lot of uh, similar symbols that they are finding in these prehistoric rock art um, across the world and uh, this is quite interesting and uh, even in india you find uh, this kind of symbols in the bhimbetika shelters and of late there are researchers who are finding them all across india so it's a very interesting uh, topic to look at closely in the future so post that you have uh, the proto writing what's called the proto writing and uh, they are found in these four uh, wa- famous river valley civilizations um so these are some of the early attempts at uh, um writing uh, it all these uh, scripts have some sort of uh, um linguistic element to them so the the four uh, civilizations which came up with these systems were the egyptians around 3400 bc and the ancient middle east around uh, 3500 uh, bc so ancient middle east is uh, commonly referred to as uh, the mesopotamian civilization and then uh, you have the south asian which goes back to 3500 bc so this is commonly referred to as the indus valley and uh, here even though we don't know exactly what these symbols are they have found them to contain some sort of a linguistic element in them <clears throat> and the last one is uh, the chinese civilization which had these oracle bone scripts uh, which uh, date back to about late 2nd millennium bc 
So you see that the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians were uh, closely linked to each other through trade and uh, there was a lot of cultural exchange between these two regions. Um, however, what we don't discuss much is that the Mesopotamians and the Indus Valley people were also quite closely linked. Um, and uh, you see a couple of seals which uh, show this, for example, here is a cylinder seal which shows an interpreter who is interpreting the Indus Valley people who were back then apparently called Meluhuns. And um, you also see uh, several seals which have similar themes in them. Uh, like here you see a bull man fighting a lion and uh, then the famous uh, three-faced uh, deity uh, supposedly who um, is also present in both these seals. And in uh, India, we popularly call this the Pashupati seal. Um, and then even the languages, you see a lot of similarity between the Vedic Samskrita and uh, the old Avastas uh, language. And um, uh, you have words like uh, Deva and Deva in both these places, y Yajna and Yashna, Hiranya and Zaranya, Sena and Hena, and so forth. Um, so when we look at the proto-writing systems that existed earlier, uh, we can see there is a sort of an evolution that's happening in the script systems of these other three civilizations. And uh, some of the scripts that we are using even today come from uh, those roots, like uh, the English is written using the Latin or the Roman script even today. And then the Hebrew, the Greek, the Coptic all go back to the Mesopotamian and the Egyptian roots. And then in China, the oracle bone script slowly evolved to become the simplified Chinese script that uh, is used today. However, the Indus Valley symbols, we don't know what happened to them. And um, it is a mystery which a lot of people are trying to solve. And uh, hopefully it'll get solved sometime soon. So stages in early writing systems in India, if you want to take a look at them, it's um, the prehistoric rock art in the beginning, after which you find the Indus Valley symbols. And uh, then you find the graffiti, what is called the graffiti symbols, which are found on pieces of pottery and such, again, which are not uh, deciphered yet entirely uh, between uh, 1000 BC to 300 BC. Then you have uh, what are called the punch marks. So they are symbols which were punched onto coins. Uh, and you find quite a few of these coins. And uh, even these symbols are not entirely deciphered. And uh, later you have uh, these punch mark coins uh, which appear with the Brahmi and the Kharoshti script. Uh, they are the two old uh, script systems uh, that uh, came about in India, South Asia. And uh, then after that you have the Brahmi, Greek and the Kharoshti scripts uh, which appear in uh, coins like these uh, Kushana coins that you see here. So from the 3rd century onwards, you see the Brahmi script dominating uh, the South Asian scene. Um, so the Karoshti slowly fell into disuse around the same period in South Asia. Here you see a student uh, learning the Brahmi script from a wooden tablet. Uh, what is interesting is that apparently they found a whole lot of uh, sculptures of this nature uh, in this dig. And, um, it would be nice to see, uh, to study those uh, rest of them closely as well. So the Brahmi script's origins remain uncertain. Uh, the story evolves as new findings are pieced together. Like here you have the two uh, pieces of pottery which contain the Brahmi script from the Kiladi excavations. And a lot of research is going on on dating them and finding out if uh, this has any implications on the Brahmi script's origins and so forth. So we still don't have a clear idea as to how the Brahmi script came about and who were the people behind them and so forth. Uh, so th if you look at uh, the Mauryan Brahmi, Mauryan Brahmi is considered like the gold standard uh, when it comes to the Brahmi script. So that is uh, usually the standard characters that are used to represent the Brahmi script today. And uh, Ashoka, the emperor Ashoka, was the person who popularized this script all across uh, the South, uh, all across the Mauryan Empire. And uh, he made these inscriptions um, all across his empire, and they are usually referred to as the Ashokan Rock Edict. 
most of these rock edicts are in the Brahmi script. Uh, that is, the majority of the inscriptions are written using the Brahmi script. And uh, then you find Karoshti inscriptions as well. And a little bit of uh, Karoshti also mixed with a few Brahmi inscriptions. And uh, towards the border regions, we find an Ashokan rock edict which contains Greek and Aramaic script as well. Um, so trade has influenced the culture and scripts for uh, several thousands of years now. So you see the Mauryan Empire uh, with the big circle and the Greek and Aramaic from uh, regions which are so far off that uh, they were trading with. If you see the Arthashastra, you see that uh, they record several prominent trade routes uh, in, that, uh, in Arthashastra. Um, which the Mauryans used. So around the 200 BC, 200 BC to 1800 CE, you have the popular silk routes or the spice routes uh, that we call today. Uh, they are there over land and sea as well. There was a lot of cultural exchange, exchange of languages, exchange of scripts uh, that were happening in these routes. So you find several script lists in uh, the old uh, Buddhist and Jain documents. And uh, one of the most popular one, which is most commonly cited, is the Lalita Vistara Sutra, uh, which lists the 64 scripts that uh, Shakyamuni Buddha knew. And uh, it is dated to around 3rd century CE. And uh, on the right, you see a very beautiful Gandhara sculpture with Shakyamuni uh, or the Buddha, who, as he is commonly known, uh, writing on a wooden tablet. And um, his assistant is standing next to him holding a pot of ink. And there's a person behind him and next to him with the wooden tablets as well. Um, so if you see the no names of the scripts on the left, you see that a lot of them we still don't know much about. Uh, the first two names are the Brahmi and Karoshti. Uh, probably uh, the names uh, that gave the colonial Indologists an idea that uh, the scripts that they had found in the subcontinent might have been Brahmi and Karoshti. And uh, then you have uh, Chinese records as well, which describe the Brahmi and Karoshti script, um, which uh, probably corroborated uh, that um, the scripts that found in India were in fact Brahmi and Karoshti, were called Brahmi and Karoshti. So over time, the Brahmi script transitioned into a variety of script systems across Southeast Asia. Here is the famous chart by uh, Shiv Mr. Shivram Murthy, which uh, is cited uh, time and again of the Brahmi script uh, evolving into several Indian scripts that we use today. So the Brahmi script, uh, which was uh, used uh, by the Mauryans, we can say for now <laughs> that it uh, branched into the northern branch and the southern branch. The northern branch became the Nagari-based scripts, and the southern branch became the Grantha-based scripts. Uh, so if you see, the writing materials and tools used seem to have influenced the character shapes of the northern branch and the southern branch over time. So on the left here, you see a beautiful painting of uh, two Nair girls writing on a palm leaf manuscript using uh, uh, an iron stylus. Uh, we call it Kanti here in uh, Karnataka. So uh, a leaf of a palm tree used to be cut and uh, treated and dried to make these palm leaves. And uh, using the sharp instrument, the characters used to be engraved into them. And uh, ink used to be applied on it and cleaned. The surface used to be clean. And where the incisions were made, the ink used to, re used to be retained uh, in them. And the writing was visible after that. So if you see the writing materials themselves, you can see that uh, writing rounded forms would have been easier on this medium. And on the right-hand side, you see the famous Lekhana Sundari sculpture. You see this sculpture across several regions of India. Uh, this is the one belonging to the Chandela dynasty. And uh, here you see, um, see her writing on a piece of birch bark, probably on a wooden board, uh, uh, using a pen which was dipped in ink, very similar to the way we write on paper today. And uh, the character shapes which evolved from this uh, method uh, were more uh, squarish and uh, 
quite pretty. So we'll be looking at uh, the southern branch, which is the Granthabe scripts. So there's uh, evolution between uh, the early Brahmi and the Grantha script, which took about 600 years. This is a very interesting area of study. However, we'll be looking at the Grantha script itself for now. Uh, so the Grantha script uh, is uh, categorized into early, middle, transitional and modern Grantha. Uh, so the early Grantha, you have uh, script systems, which is like the Kadamba and the Pallava. And the middle Grantha, you have uh, the Imperial Pallava script, which is the extremely ornate script, which is um, usually ascribed to the Pallavas. Uh, it is in the column two here. And uh, the transitional Grantha, what is interesting is that the transitional and the middle Grantha existed around the same time. Um, there's a slight overlap there. And um, the transitional Grantha is in blue. Uh, there are several different varieties of transitional Grantha. This is the Pallava transitional early Grantha. So it seems to be more of a practical uh, script to use as compared to the ornate forms of the middle Grantha. And uh, the Tulu Tiglari script is evolved from this particular uh, Grantha style, which is uh, we still have to study quite a bit in what happened to this transitional Grantha between the Pallava, Chola, Cheras, and the Pandyas. So around 1100, we can safely say the Tiglari script um, uh, branched away from uh, the other Tamil Grantha style. So the modern Grantha is what's used in Tamil Nadu today uh, to write uh, Samskrita in several of the Veda Patashalas there. So that's the script you see in uh, the column four. So the time period between uh, early Grantha and transitional Grantha is uh, about 100 years only. So it is a very interesting area of study and uh, to see what exactly happened during that time. So the Tulu Tiglari script essentially belongs to the larger family of uh, scripts called the Grantha script. So the Grantha script spread to Southeast Asia as well. The script routes seem to follow the then trade routes. Here you see the famous uh, Sri Vijaya sculpture, um, which uh, might have be, which represents a ship which might have been used back then uh, along the trade routes on the Indian Ocean, connecting India to Southeast Asia. And the map here shows the trade, trade routes which might have been used back then. And uh, here I've listed a few script systems in Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, and so forth, which follow the Grantha style of scripts. Um, there are a lot more scripts uh, than the ones mentioned here. Uh, but uh, for the sake of this presentation, I've just uh, uh, kept a few on this slide. Then uh, the Grantha script was primarily used to write the Sanskrit language texts in South India. Um, here uh, you see a copper plate, uh, which has both the Grantha script as well as the Vattelhutta script. Uh, it is quite common to find uh, these two scripts used uh, together. Uh, you see the Samskrita parts uh, written using the Grantha script and the Tamil parts are written using the Vattelhutta script. This particular copper plate is uh, known for having the name of the King Raja Raja written in it. And um, due to that, it also seems that the Grantha script uh, seems to have been associated with esteem and honor as well. So this is a very important concept, uh, which is that the languages and scripts are not entirely related to each other. So if you look at the Sanskrit language, uh, it was written using several scripts across India in the olden days. So a language can be written using several different script systems. Um, and uh, several languages can be written using the same script. Here the word language is uh, written in different languages using the same script. And I'm sure even uh, you would be writing Kannada SMSs in English sometimes <laughs> if it is difficult to find the keyboards and uh, so forth. Our history is multilingual and multi-script with a lot of give and take between cultures across regions. Uh, here is the famous Pallava 
uh, pillar inscription which has uh, several uh, uh, different scripts and uh, languages all uh, inscribed on the same pillar and you also see a lot of experimental experimentation with the character shapes calligraphy uh, in the Grantha style. So traveling for education and trade has been prevalent in India for over two millennia. Uh, maybe this is a good reason for languages and scripts to inter intermingle and influence each other. Uh, here is a slide from uh, Mr. Giovanni from the French Institute, his uh, research, uh, where he found uh, the Grantha script used to write uh, several languages like Sanskrit, Telugu, etc. Uh, you also find multiple scripts uh, used in the same manuscript. This is also extremely common in manuscripts all across India. Uh, here is a Tulu Tiglari and a Nandinagari script on the same leaf of a manuscript. And uh, below is the Tulu Tiglari along with the Kannada script. So there are several uh, major Brahmic script families that were used in Karnataka, which is the Brahmi, and uh, the Kannada Telugu script, which later, later branched into the Kannada and the Telugu script. And uh, then you have the Grantha script, and then the Tamil, then the Tulu Tigilari and Nandinagari. So the research on Tulu Tigilari and Nandinagari is not much, even though we find a large number of manuscripts in Karnataka uh, in these two scripts. Despite knowing multiple scripts, oral transmission and Abhinaya formats seem to have been the preferred mediums of knowledge transmission in the subcontinent. Uh, oral formats of education has today taken a back seat and literary formats have taken precedence. Oral languages are looked down upon and forced to change. Oral languages build communities, they bring us closer to nature and connect us to our immediate surroundings. Uh, we can see uh, how the oral languages can be strengthened by building new education models around them. Uh, for a country which has prided of its uh, oral language heritage, I think uh, this is something uh, that we can tackle easily today uh, because we have a lot of minority languages uh, which are mostly in their oral forms and looking at new paradigms of education for these oral languages might be interesting to look into. Uh, that was a side note. So now we come to the main topic, the Tulu Tiglari script. Uh, the Tulu Tiglari script was mostly used in the western regions of Karnataka and uh, the northernmost district of Kerala called Kasargod. Uh, so Udupi, Dakshina Kannada and Kasargod was earlier considered uh, Tulu Nadu and uh, uh, that I have marked as the Tulu speaking region which used the Tulu Tiglari script and Uttara Kannada, Shomoga and Chikmangalur um, are mostly Kannada speaking and uh, those districts too use the Tulu Tiglari script. So we have found over one lakh manuscripts and around uh, 60 stone inscriptions in these regions in the Tulu Tiglari script. And uh, you, find the e you find equal number of manuscripts in both these regions, so you can't really say it was used more in one particular region as opposed to another. It, is, it seems quite even. So there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the names associated with this script and the script systems around them. So Tulu Tiglari script itself was uh, called uh, the Western Grantha script or the Tulu Malayalam in a few academic publications around the 19th century by early uh, Western scholars here. And uh, Tulu Lipi and Taulava Lipi in the coastal Karnataka, and uh, it was also used by the Western scholars. It was called uh, Tiglari or Tiglaria in uh, Tulu Nadu, Mal Nadu, and uh, Uttara Kannada. And also the Western scholars have referred to this script as Tulu Tiglari. Uh, is that Tiglari, sorry. And uh, it was called the Grantha Lipi and Tulu Grantha Lipi in the Udupi Ashtamatas. So when I started my research, uh, it was usually, the script was usually called the Grantha Lipi in the Udupi Ashtamatas. And there's a 
very interesting uh, paddhati that they follow there uh, where uh, the seers of uh, the ashtamatas even today are forbidden to use any other script other than the tulu tiglari script and uh, they sign their names uh, using this script even today uh, however the story behind why this was is uh, lost <coughs> so this is the uh, huge debate that's happening right now uh, the Tiglari script and the Tulu script, which are identified as two different script systems, um, are essentially one and the same. Uh, that is what I'm saying here today. Uh, after going to all the archives with manuscripts and looking at the stone inscriptions, which are marked either Tiglari or Tulu script, and examining them closely, uh, what I found is that there is absolutely no difference between these two scripts. They are one and the same. There's not even 1% of difference you can find between these two scripts. And uh, for whatever reasons, we need to <laughs> uh, let go of this confusion and just come to a consensus and call it the Tulu Tiglari script. So the Kannada speaking regions uh, used to call this script the Tiglari script and the Tulu speaking regions called this the Tulu script. Um, so if you look at the stone inscriptions and palm leaf manuscripts, uh, the stone inscriptions are much older and uh, palm leaf manuscripts, they tend to uh, decay over time and uh, we don't have samples which are as old as the stone inscriptions. Uh, so there's a slight difference in the character shapes between the stone inscriptions and the palm leaf manuscripts, but uh, the variation is extremely slight. It's only across uh, around three characters. And uh, the orthography of the script, however, remains identical between these two mediums. And uh, the Tulu Tiglari script, surprisingly, is very, very uniform across the manuscripts. And uh, they are very easy to read. <coughs> so in Karnataka, Tigula, the term Tigula seems to be used uh, to refer to people of the Tamil origin, or something of the Tamil origin. Here, uh, uh, from uh, B.L. Rice's Epigraphia Karnataka, Volume 3, you see that he has uh, put the word Tamil in brackets next to the word Tigula. You also find this uh, around the 1800s, we find several references to Tigula, meaning Tamil in the colonial context. You find this reference in Kasten tribes of South India, in Epigraphia Karnataka, Aircross, various gazetteers, etc. However, it might not be the same uh, Tigula community mentioned by uh, Sarvagnya Vachana Tripadi and uh, by Kalidasa in Mohana Tarangini. Uh, there's a paper written on it in 2005 by Mr. Paneer Selvam called Tigular, uh, and it's in this journal called Studies in Indian Epigraphy. Uh, the Tigula, there's a community called Tigula in Bangalore. So. Uh, this script, the Tulu Tiglari script and uh, the community has no connection with each other. They are completely different. So you see three sister script systems, the Tamil Grantha script, the Tulu Tiglari script and the Arya Alit, which is called uh, the Grantha Malayalam these days. Uh, so a lot of people used to refer to both the Tulu Tiglari and the uh, older Malayalam script as the um, Tulu Malayalam script. Um, after examining both these scripts, we find uh, some orthographic and uh, glyph, uh, glyph shape differences between these two scripts. Uh, they are not one and the same. Uh, and the same with Tamil Grantha and uh, these other two scripts as well. They are three different script systems. So the Tigilari, so this is uh, the confusion like. Uh, so, Tiglari is the term used to call uh, the Tamil Grantha script. Uh, for example, here on the right you see uh, a reading from an inscription that was uh, found near Tinarsipura, Mysore, um, where an of it is from uh, 1290 AD. An official gave a donation for the opening of a primary school at Malingi, probably the name uh, used for that region back then and made arrangements to teach Nagara, Kannada and Tiglaria. So 
like the inscription stones of Bangalore people might be able to <laughs> say that around those regions, you don't find many Tulu Tiglari inscriptions, but you find uh, several uh, Tamil Grantha inscriptions around those regions. So most probably the uh, Tigularia that is mentioned here might be referring to the Tamil Grantha script, and Tiglari might be the name that was used for Tamil Grantha script as well as Tulu Tiglari script in Karnataka. And uh, the term Grantha is used for the Tamil Grantha script, Grantha Malayalam, and the Tulu Tiglari script. Uh, Tulu Malayalam is used to refer to Grantha Malayalam or Aryalithu and the Tulu Tiglari script. And uh, like discussed earlier, the Tulu script is the same as the Tiglari script, uh, which we, uh, Vinod and I, have chosen to call uh, the Tulu Tiglari script. So the languages that are found in the manuscripts uh, of Tulu Tiglari are uh, Samskrita. You find over one lakh manuscripts written in the Samskrita language. Then you have the Kannada language uh, manuscripts. You find about 10 or 15 of them. And um, in Tulu language, you find uh, four to six manuscripts. Uh, the inscriptions uh, are uh, being studied right now, and we still don't have clarity about uh, the languages and scripts exactly. So these are approximations that I have put here. And uh, it is common to write uh, grants uh, and uh, donations in the regional languages. So it is no surprise that uh, uh, you find several regional languages uh, appearing in the inscriptions here. So uh, the Tulu script, what is called the Tulu script, um, was not created for the Tulu, Tulu language. So there's a lot of confusion here. Because of the name Tulu script, a lot of uh, Tulu uh, people think that it was a script which was created exclusively for the Tulu language. But that's not the case. Um, Script was you, the script was used both in the Kannada and the Tulu-speaking regions, primarily to write Samskrita language texts. More inscriptions and manuscripts written in the script use the Kannada language comparatively. Uh, the Tulu script seems to have been a term popularized by the missionaries. Uh, Tulu was an oral language. Tulu's uh, rich literature was mostly in the oral form. Tulu is quite rich as a language. But uh, most of it was in the oral form. Uh, there is a huge language variation in the few samples found. So even in the manuscripts that are found and the inscriptions, you see that there's no standardized Tulu language that's used uh, in any of this. Uh, they are mostly like the local um, dialects of Tulu. Tulu language has a lot of dialects. So you find several dialects of Tulu appearing in these uh, manuscripts and inscriptions. So the difference between an oral language and a written and a literary language is that in uh, literary languages you find a lot of texts which talk about uh, uh, the language itself. The how do you standardize the language? How do you write it? And there's a lot of discourse around language itself. And um, in Tulu, you see the first grammar being uh, written in uh, 1872 by uh, Reverend Brigel. <coughs> It's uh, based on the Kannada and the Samskrita grammar. And if you see the other languages uh, which had a linguistic tradition, like which were considered the literary languages, uh, you find the Samskrita grammar uh, goes back, the grammar of Samskrita goes back to more than uh, 2,000 years, um, which is supposed to have been uh, written by people like uh, Maharishis, like Patanjali, Panini, Yaska, etc. And uh, the Tamil grammar is uh, supposed is ascribed to Tolkapir and uh, is dated around 300 BC. And uh, Tolkapir himself refers to several older grammars uh, in his uh, in his uh, writings. Uh, so Tamil grammar also goes back quite uh, to the BCs. And um, Kannada grammar, uh, you see uh, the early, early samples of Kannada grammar found is uh, Amogavarsha, which goes back to around 800 CE. And the current Kannada grammar is based on uh, Keshi Raja's uh, Shabdamani Darpana, uh, which goes back to 1260 CE. 
So the current uh, Kannada grammar was composed based on the manuscripts they found of Keshi Raja's works. Uh, so the Kannada script supports uh, Tulu language better, is what I'm proposing here. Uh, Tulu Tigilari has a few characters missing. Uh, so there are a few characters like the vowel A and the vowel O that are missing in the Tulu Tiglari script which I used uh, quite, uh, quite a lot in uh, the Tulu language and the Tulu dynasties have been a part of the Kannada landscape for over a thousand years so I, I don't see why we can't use the Kannada language, uh, Kannada script to write the Tulu language you have more than 700 books that are printed in Tulu using the Kannada script already and I'd say that it's good to stick to that model. So there is a claim that uh, the Tulu, uh, Mahab Tulu Ramayana used the term uh, Tulu Lippi on the cover of its manuscript. So here is the cover of the manuscript and it says number 23 Tulu Barahu Tulu Bashe Ramayana. So if you're using number 23, it clearly states, it clearly indicates that it was written post the colonial times and it is quite recent and not an old reference to the name of the script. Almost all the Tulu language manuscripts found in this script are uh, Sanskrita works trans, uh, translated to uh, Tulu dialect. So the original Tulu literature was in the oral forms. Tulu people were literate and knew several languages and scripts, but they chose to use the Tulu language mostly in its oral form. The eighth schedule of our constitution recognizes oral literature. Also, the eighth schedule is unfair to a large number of minority languages across India and it should be revisited. So I'd suggest the effort that is being put into creating a new script called the Tulu script for the Tulu language uh, putting in efforts to look at how the age schedule treats uh, minority languages would help a lot of minority languages around Tulu as well. Uh, if we look at uh, Tulu language revitalization, it is something, it is a very exciting space to be in today. The culture is rich and ancient, the people are fun, uh, and of course you have pristine beaches and forests around the Tulu regions, so I'd see why uh, a researcher would not want to go there. So, like they say, happy cultures live longer. Again, there is confusion between Tiglari script and the Kannada language. It was not a script uh, that was created for the Kannada language as well. Um, most of Kannada literature used the Kannada script. Uh, there are only a small number of samples of the Tulu Tiglari books using the Kannada language. So essentially what I'm saying is the Tulu Tiglari script was used primarily to write uh, the Sanskrita language uh, text. So I have written much, much more <laughs> about this topic uh, in a paper called Naming the Tulu Tiglari Script, which uh, you can download from academia.edu. It's unpublished, but it has uh, several more references and uh, a lot more information on this. The materials that were used to write the script were stone, uh, metal, paper, and palm leaf. Uh, but the majority of the samples you find are on palm leaves. So the kind of manuscripts that you find are uh, Shaiva, Vaishnava, and Shakta uh, uh, books, um, which are mostly religious books. And uh, then you also find uh, samples of account books, uh, books on mathematics, astronomy, astrology, about the healing arts, about you find several personal notes, uh, legal records. Recently I found a couple of uh, legal records which had uh, Marathi written in the Tulu Tiglari script along with a few words of Gujarati written in it as well. Um, so a large number of these manuscripts have not been read, uh, uh, read even till today and it'll be nice to like uh, read through them, catalog them, and make them available for researchers. So how did the Tulu Tiglari script get here to the western um, regions of Karnataka and north of Kerala? Um, we still don't know how it got here. If you look at the character shapes, uh, in general they are very similar to the medieval Sinhala script 
and interestingly the uh, few samples of the Thai Brahmanical Grantha uh, when you compare them you see a lot of uh, similarities between them and also uh, examining the various uh, transitional Granthas from India will also uh, give us a clue as to what was happening back then uh, between uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century India and uh, the Alupas who were the rulers of the Tulu region and the neighboring regions were considered themselves Pandyas and then we know about uh, the Pandyan influence in Sri Lanka as well so this is a very interesting topic to look into the orthography of the Tulu Tiglari script follows the Pandyan system uh, you have the vowels uh, I, E and so forth and then you have uh, the consonant groups uh, ka, cha, ta, ta, pa, and semi vowels yara, lava, and so forth. And then you have the two archaic Dravidian uh, sounds r and l, which is uh, commonly called the bandira here, and the l sound. Uh, the consonants combine with vowel marks to form uh, kaka, kiki, uh, and um, you have uh, a Tulu special sound uh, which is represented in the uh, stone inscriptions and the palm leaf manuscripts so this sound is uh, referred to as uh, Samrito Karam in Kerala and it is also referred to by Tolkapir and uh, this uh sound is not represented with the, uh, Halant and uh, U Matra but it is represented using only the Halant in the Tulu Tiglari script, unlike the Malayalam script, which uses it with the Umatra. Uh, so the consonants uh, form several conjuncts, very similar to the Tamil Brahmi script. Uh, you find a huge number of conjuncts in this script, and uh, they are formed either horizontally or vertically, like the Kannada script uh, forms conjuncts vertically, and they're called Vattus. Uh, so here, these Vattus can happen horizontally as well as vertically and you find uh, Vedic marks and uh, special characters in the script as well uh, I've been trying to make a font for this script from around 2004 uh, I started off uh, so my project uh, was is not as linear as I'm presenting it right now uh, there was a lot of back and forth that was happening but I'm trying to present it in a understandable manner so I started my project by looking at some of the manuscripts in my ancestral home. This is my uncle here, showing me some of the manuscripts uh, that were there in the attic. And um, after collecting samples across various regions, um, <coughs> uh, I tabulated them uh, and studied if there are any historical influences on the varying character shapes uh, that I had found. Uh, post which uh, I had to arrive at a glyph set, like a uh, character set which standardizes the script. Since this was never printed before, I had to look at all the variations in the glyph shapes to arrive at the most common form and also list the alternate forms. So right now we use something called uh, open, so open type uh, coding. Uh, where you can have multiple different uh, versions of the same character supported within the same font so you don't have to really like break your head as much as you had to earlier in terms of finding one standardized glyph shape uh, you can identify one as a default shape and have the rest supported in the stylistic sets so here you have the standard form and the alternate forms uh, listed and uh, that was done for all the characters uh, in this script especially there are a lot of characters that look similar here is one example of ka, cha, pa, ma and va uh, which look quite similar in the manuscripts so I had to identify the more distinct character shapes uh, that were commonly found across the manuscripts and identify them as the default forms that were represented in the font that I was making so the default forms and the alternate shapes uh, were identified and I used this app called uh, the glyphs app to design the fonts so the same was done for uh, uh, the consonants and the vowel marks as well here the k and the u is shown uh, combining in different ways 
uh, it's the same uh, for uh, most of the other characters as well. So again, here the common forms and the alternate forms were identified and uh, tabulated, and uh, the and the characters were designed uh, for all the characters and uh, vowel mark combinations. Uh, so this script has a lot of ligating conjuncts, and again uh, you have two, three, four, five characters combining together. Uh, so all those characters were identified. Uh, tabulated and uh, listed and here again the default form and the stylistic alternates were identified and designed and that was done for a whole range of uh, combining characters there are a lot more than this uh, it's very similar to the Grantha script even Grantha has a huge uh, conjunct list uh, this script has a lot of special characters uh, the two brothers uh, Srinidhi and Sridatta especially specialize in this uh, and uh, they helped us uh, identify a lot of characters in this script system. Uh, so you have the germination mark, the tiddu mark, the danda, chandra bindu. Here on the left hand side you see the pushpika on top and then the tiddu mark, that was a mark used to show that there's something, there's a correction that's happening around there. So these are kind of the punctuations that were used back then. And uh, here you have the Udatta and, Swari uh, and uh, Swarita Vedic uh, vowel marks, uh, Vedic, uh, Vedic sounds that are marked there. And uh, then you have the Shri, which uh, behaves like a Pushpika. And then the Om Pushpika and the Shri Pushpika are uh, used as decorative elements in the manuscript. So after studying the script, uh, the complexity of the script, the tallest and the deepest character were identified and uh, the font matrix was set based, uh, based on that. And uh, since we don't know the uh, traditional terminology that was used to identify different parts of the script, uh, they were, uh, I just coined some English names for different parts of the script so that it's easy to communicate as to what part of the character you're referring to. Then the whole character set was designed based on that. So if, even if you have a font, unless you have Unicode support, you won't be able to type uh, uh, using that. So Vinod Rajan and I have been working on encoding the script uh, we have submitted several, several papers uh, for, uh, for the approval to the Unicode Technical Committee. Uh, Srinidhi and Sridatta have also contributed a great deal to this. Uh, Vinod Rajan, uh, who has worked on this with me, is uh, a PhD f uh, in digital paleography. He's from Chennai and he's currently living in Germany. Uh, his page is virtualvinod.com. So he has worked on uh, several scripts like uh, Tamil Grantha and Sharda as well. And uh, there's a very interesting uh, project that he has uh, on his website called uh, the Akshara Mukha. It's a very nice app which lets you uh, go between scripts. So if you have uh, typed something out in uh, Kannada, you can immediately switch to a Devanagari or any other script system uh, that uh, you prefer and he has a lot of scripts uh, supported there from around the world. So if you look at Unicode, what is Unicode? Unicode essentially is a code uh, that is assigned to a character. So if there is a character A, the code, it's a hexadecimal code. So the code that is assigned to the character A is uh, U plus 0041. So that code is uh, transferred to several different machines which also have all the codes uh, embedded in them and uh, they uh, can identify that this character is the letter A. So when I type something on my mobile phone and I send it to your laptop, you will be able to read the same message without downloading any software. So that is, uh, that is the norm right now. And uh, for those who are using ASCII formats, uh, you know the challenges that you face, you'll have to download a software, install it, and uh, the, whatever you have typed will only work on your system and you won't be able to transfer it freely. Uh, so the Unicode technology also supports uh, OCR as well as voice to text. So I'd suggest for those who are using ASCII, it's good to switch to Unicode. And um, 
for Tulu Tigilari, when we had to get this character encoding, we had to uh, look at every single aspect of the script, the glyph shapes, uh, how they form, is it placed before, after, above, below, the variations, the attestations and so forth. And uh, finally it was accepted into Unicode in January 2002. Uh, <laughs> Finally, yeah, I felt like that uh, emoji there. Uh, so um, soon you'll be able to type uh, uh, the Tulu Tiglari script in its original form, both in uh, the forms that you see in palm leaf manuscripts and the stone inscriptions. And you'll also be able to type the Vedic text with all the swara marks uh, around them, uh, or the ones that we have identified so far. Uh, so, all the Tulu Tiglari research and documentation is available online on academia.edu on my page. So, all those tables that I showed you and uh, all the character shapes, all of that information is available online for researchers who are interested to work on this script. And I'd like to especially thank uh, Tara Prakashana Bangalore who uh, digitized the palm leaf manuscripts that I had given them. And uh, the quality was exceptional and it made our work so much easy to refer to the character shapes. And uh, Dr. S. R. Vignaraj from Dharmasthala, who was uh, the only person who knew how to read the script back in 2003, and uh, he taught me how to read the script back then. Uh, and of course, Srinidhi Sridhata A for supporting us with the, all their findings. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, this is the end of my talk. You can reach me by my email or follow me on Twitter or Instagram uh, and write to me if you have any queries in the future about the script. Vaishnavi Murthy or Gay Yellow Parvagi Danya Adalu to Mahiti Ukta Upanyasa Vagito. You have Vedic Mel Barbek on the Kelkotine. You are the Prashnag Lidra and the old Prashnag Gaukasha there. Another question is there, Kushal? Madam. Yes, it is very interesting to see the Samrutha Swara. It is very interesting. It is very interesting. We can translate it. Because uh, there are a lot of East Asian uh, languages, Chinese, we can actually start writing today the Chinese transliterations in Roman. Uh, all of them are defective. Uh, if, 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 for example, Devanagari or uh, you know Tigalari Lipi would will be much more phonetic than transliterating in Roman, and the Samrutha Swara will be very useful. Is any uh, with you with Vinod? Is there any chance to propagate this? schemes uh, which he has put in place there. So you can choose whichever transli transliteration scheme that you want to translate it into, to uh, change it into from whichever script that you want. It's a really nice tool, it's very easy to use. Any plan to, huh. any plan to propagate the Unicode Samrutha Swara mm -hmm. to other Unicode Indic scripts? Uh, I think uh, Malayalam already has it. Uh, and uh, Tamil, I, it is there only in the research papers. Uh, Sinhala has it, it is already encoded. And uh, a lot of Southeast Asian scripts already have it. Yeah. For if there are any new uh, sounds or characters that uh, you have identified, uh, you can uh, share those findings with the Unicode Consortium with the paper and uh, try to include them into Unicode. Like Srinidhi and Sridhata have worked on several uh, languages and scripts uh, across India to support uh, these uh, special sounds that exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I congratulate you on the presenting such an interesting and uh, very informative paper. Thank you, thank you. On scripts. My uh, it's not a question, it's just an addition. Uh, the first Tirthankara, Adinata Rujaba Deva, had two daughters, Brahmi and Sundari, and 
it is uh, the first Tirthankara Rishabhadeva taught the Brahmi script to his daughter Brahmi. The, all the scripts evolved from that Brahmi script and uh, it is uh, traced, uh, its origin is traced to Indus Valley Civilization. And uh, the idol of uh, uh, the Samavartana of first Tirthankara is represented, but that was that has an, a different interpretation as uh, Lord Pashupati, Lord of all animals and creatures. But uh, it is considered as the Samavasarana ceremony of uh, uh, Lord uh, Bhushapadeva. So it is uh, Brahmi who received the knowledge of all scripts from her father, Bhushapadeva. So the history of uh, scripts that uh, especially Brahmi script emerges from the Indus Valley civilization as old as thousands of years ago, probably 5,000 years ago. Thank you, Madam. Thank My you name is Dr. Shamla Ratna Kumar. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, are there, is, were there ASCII versions uh, before you did the Unicode, uh, this one for Tulu Tiglari? Uh, there were, uh, there still are ASCII versions of uh, what is called the Tulu Lipi. Uh, so that is actually uh, based on the Tulu Tiglari script and uh, the characters are slightly different. It is considered like if you ask the Tulu Academy, they'll say it's a new invention. Uh, so I don't know what to exactly call it. <laughs> okay, but is there a lot of... Um information or documents already in that or it's not used much? Uh, there are about two books printed in them. In that. Okay. And uh, there are some uh, boards that are printed in them in because uh, they're trying to introduce the script for the Tulu language. Hi. Um, congratulations on your research and um, getting the Unicode encoding. Um, I had a question, more of a clarification. You said the conjuncts are um, either vertical stacking or horizontal. Is it that some are horizontal conjuncts and some are vertical conjuncts or either um, or? So there are certain characters that uh, ligate horizontally and some vertically. Uh, so the uh, most common form is uh, used as the default form. So you can, uh, the, like the ka and the ka example that I showed, uh, you see both the forms uh, appearing on the same leaf. Okay. So it's not even a matter of handwriting. It's, it's uh, quite random uh, to see how these conjuncts are uh, constructed in the manuscripts. Uh, so the most common form is uh, used as a default. And uh, to break it, uh, there are several, uh, if you see the Unicode encoding, it's encoded very differently from the other scripts. Yeah. Uh, so the Virama is not made into a control character. There is a separate uh, control character which controls the behavior of the conjuncts itself. Okay. So it makes it easier to choose which characters uh, you want to appear. So in like in your, in your font uh, that you're working on, is that then an alternate, like a stylistic alternate, w whether you choose to like put your conjunct as a vertical ligature or horizontal? Yeah, it uh, can be treated as a stylistic alternate, but it is also possible to access that using uh, the specific control characters which form those uh, conjuncts. Okay, thanks. It's all this information is there in the Unicode proposal. The whole proposal is there online. So all the different behaviors and uh, uh, the new control characters that have been added, all, all the information is there. Yes, I have, uh, I have uh, met him and uh, I have uh, written quite a bit about his work in the paper that's available online. Uh, so all that information about all the scholars who had worked on this previously and their contributions and all of that is there in the paper that's there online. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
you uh, I'm, i am interested to know how much of this corpus is yet to be read the uh, i say about uh, 90% and uh, the manuscript libraries carrying this uh, are concentrated more in the areas that you showed there i'm sure it is there in chennai and other libraries also but uh, the concentration would be more in the coastal areas yeah. is that right yeah yeah so the manuscripts that are there in the other archives you find it all over the world actually uh, the tulu tiglari manuscripts uh, but the origin in all of their document in their uh, catalogs is traced back to these regions so it it says that it is recorded that they all came from these regions originally ah oh, okay thank you and uh, you find uh, one uh, stone inscription in uh, in uh, andhra pradesh uh, karnataka border as well in the tulu tiglari script um so there are these uh, few samples that are found outside uh, but the large majority is here okay thank you ಿಗಳಾರಿ ತುಳು ತಿಗಳಾರಿ ಎನ್ನುವ ಹೆಸರು ಕೊಟ್ಟಿರೋದ್ರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ನನ್ನ ವಿರೋಧ ಇದೆ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ತಿಗಳಾರಿ ಲಿಪಿ ವಾಸ್ತವವಾಗಿರೋದು ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಬಂದ ಬರೆಯೋದಕ್ಕೋಸ್ಕರ ತಿಗಳಾರಿ ಲಿಪಿ ನಿಮಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತಿರೋ ಹಾಗೆ ಗ್ರಂಥ ಲಿಪಿಯಿಂದ ಮೂಡಿ ಬಂದದ್ದು ಗ್ರಂಥ ರೂಪೆ ಕಲಕ್ಕೇಲ್ ಪಾರಮ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ರೈಟನ್ ಪಾರಮ್ಮೇ ತಿಗಳಾರಿ ಲಿಪಿ ಅದು ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಶಿವಮೊಗ್ಗ ಜಿಲ್ಲೆ ದ ಉತ್ತರ ಕನ್ನಡ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಕನ್ನಡ ಜಿಲ್ಲೆ ಪ್ರಚಲಿತವಾಗಿ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ವರ್ಗದವರೇ ಹೆಚ್ಚಿಗೆ ಅವರ ವೈದಿಕ ಸಾಹಿತ್ಯ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಸಾಹಿತ್ಯಕ್ಕೋಸ್ಕರವೇ ಬಳಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಿದ್ದ ಲಿಪಿ ಅದನ್ನು ಹೇಗೆ ತುಳುಗೆ ಅಂತ ಹಾಕ್ಕೊಳ್ತೀರಿ ಅಂತ ಒಂದು ಎರಡನೇ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ತುಳುಗೆ ತನ್ನದೇ ಆದ ಲಿಪಿ ಯಾವ ಕಾಲದಲ್ಲೂ ಇದ್ದಿದ್ದಿಲ್ಲ ಕೆಲವು ಇತ್ತೀಚೆಗೆ ಒಂದು ಎರಡು ಮೂರು ಶಾಸನಗಳನ್ನು ತುಳು ಲಿಪಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಈಗಿನ ತಿಳಾರಿ ಲಿಪಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಬರೆದಿರೋ ತುಳು ಶಾಸನಗಳು ಕಂಡು ಬಂದಿದೆ ಅದೇನು ಆಶ್ಚರ್ಯ ಅಲ್ಲ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ಈ ತಿಳಾರಿ ಲಿಪಿಯಲ್ಲೇ ಬರೆದಿರೋ ಕನ್ನಡ ಕೃತಿಗಳು ಅದಕ್ಕಿಂತಲೂ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಇದೆ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ಒಂದು ಯಾವುದಾದ್ರೂ ಲಿಪಿ ಭಾಳ ಅಚ್ಚಸಬಲ್ ಇದ್ದರೆ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇರೆ ಭಾಷೆ ಲಿಪಿಗಳು ಬರೀತಾರೆ ಇವಾಗ ನಾಗರಿ ಲಿಪಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಅನೇಕ ಭಾಷೆ ಲಿಪಿಗಳು ಬರೀಲಿಕ್ಕಾಗ್ತದೆ ತಿಳಾರಿ ಲಿಪಿಯಲ್ಲೂ ಹಾಗೆ ಬರೆದಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಗ್ರಂಥ ಲಿಪಿಯಲ್ಲೂ ಬರೆದಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದರಿಂದ ತುಳುಗೆ ಅನ್ನೋದು ಪ್ರತ್ಯೇಕವಾದ ಲಿಪಿಯನ್ನು ಆರೋಪಿಸ್ಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಹೊರತಿರೋ ಅಂಥ ಇದಿದೆಯಲ್ಲ ಅದು ತುಂಬ ತಪ್ಪು ಅದು ತಿಳಾರಿನೇ ತಿಳಾರಿ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿರೋದು ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಕ್ಕೋಸ್ಕರವೇ ತಿಳಾರಿಗೆ ತುಳುಗೆ ಒಂದು ಲಿಪಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅಂತ ವ್ಯಥೆ ಪಡ್ತಾ ಇರೋದು ಮಹಾ ತಪ್ಪು ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ಪ್ರಪಂಚದಲ್ಲಿರುವ ಮಹಾ ಅನೇಕ ಅನೇಕ ಬ್ರ ಲಿಪಿಗಳಿಗೆ ಬ್ರ ಲಿಪಿನೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಉದಾಹರಣೆಗೆ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ಗೆ ಲಿಪಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅವ್ರು ಬಳಸ್ತಾ ಇರೋದು ಬೇರೆ ಲಿಪಿ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಕ್ಕೆ ಲಿಪಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ನಾಗರಿ ಲಿಪಿನ ಬಳಸ್ತಾವ್ರೆ ಮರಾಠಿಗೆ ನಾಗರಿ ಲಿಪಿ ಬಳಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ತೆಲುಗುಗೆ ಲಿಪಿ ಇಲ್ಲ ಕನ್ನಡ ಲಿಪಿನೇ ಬಳಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಈ ರೀತಿ ಲಿಪಿಗೂ ಭಾಷೆಗೂ ಸಂಬಂಧ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅನವಶ್ಯಕವಾಗಿ ತುಳುಗೆ ಇದನ್ನು ಲಿಪಿ ಅಂತ ಆರೋಪಿಸ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿರೋದು ತಪ್ಪು ಅನ್ನೋ ನನ್ನ ಅಭಿಪ್ರಾಯ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಇನ್ನೇನು ಇಲ್ಲ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ನಾನು ನಿಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಮೀಟ್ ಮಾಡೋಕ್ಕೆ ತುಂಬ ಟೈಮಿಂದ ಟ್ರೈ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಿಮ್ಮನ್ನು ನೋಡಿ ಖುಷಿ ಆಯಿತು ಅಲ್ಲ